a toast. So fill your glasses with the finest Kool-Aid as we celebrate the beautiful black creatives who made tremendous shockwaves in the art community through their positive portrayals and promotions of blackness and calls for unity from the South Side to Highland Park to Venice, Italy. Afro-Cobra paved the way for unapologetic expressions of black creativity with a goal to preach positivity to our people. This collective of brilliant black minds knew there were endless possibilities and refused to be silent because with art comes social and spiritual responsibilities. They provided the visual representation to combat the degradation that black America had always been facing. So on this special occasion, I would like to propose another toast to this bad artist from Chi-Town. You can give this brother an easel, textile, glass, enamel, mixed media, or even a loaf of bread, and he still gonna know how to throw it down. I'd like to propose a toast to the brother with the most style. Let's toast to the brother who braided his daughter's hair until they both got to high school. Let's toast the brother straight out of George Washington Carver High School. Let's toast to the brother who was cultivated under the talented tutelage of John John Wilson and Lois May Lou Jones. This brother's impact is felt in all cities. Let's toast to a brother who creates spiritual and visual rap cities. To the brother that's been holding it down since the late 60s. Let's toast to the brother that lifts as he continues to climb. One day he told me to look at my watch and said, It's nation time. I looked over and told him, Yeah, that's fitting. Then he told me, We're not about subjugating. We're about uplifting. And then I asked him about activism, and he said to me, young brother, I feel you should know. And an activist is a collaborative process of engaging and, and, and working with others yes. beyond your limited space for a greater goal. Go Let's toast to the brother that is a living testament of being able to get over life's hurdles. Let's toast to the brother that reminds us to persevere and remain steadfast. 
like the turtle. Let's toast to the brother that reminded us that ain't nobody nothing without God. Let's toast to the brother that constantly reminds us that anything is possible when we use love and have community on our side. He's got the love of humanity in his heart and the benevolence of the ancestors in his bones. So please, let's raise our glasses of Kool-Aid to Mr. Napoleon Jones Henderson. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Hello, my name is Kevin Arrow. I think we nailed that intro tonight. Uh, that's one for the one for the record books. Um, I'm the exhibitions and project manager at MOCA North Miami. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for Conversations at MOCA with Napoleon Jones Henderson in conversation with Carter Jackson Brown. Tonight, we are honored to host multidisciplinary artist and educator, Napoleon Jones Henderson who was included in the MOCA exhibition's Afrocobra Messages to the People from 2018 and Afrocobra Nation Time from 2019, which were both curated by Dr. Jeffreen Hayes. Napoleon's work is also featured in the newly released publication uh, commemorating the two exhibitions um, and the link for purchasing this handsome publication will be in the chat. Sorry about the green screen. Um, <laughs> Before proceeding, MOCA acknowledges that we stand on the current and ancestral home of the Seminole and Miccosukee tribe of Indians of Florida. We further acknowledge the Calusa, Jaiga, Maya Imi, and Tequesta peoples, all historic caretakers of this land. We honor and thank them for their past, present, and future stewardship of Southern Florida. MOCA North Miami exhibitions and programs are made possible with the generous support of the North Miami Mayor and Council and the City of North Miami and the Miami-Dade County Department of Cultural Affairs. We also want to thank our Board of Trustees, our corporate foundation partners, and our members. Conversations at MOCA is presented by the Green Family Foundation, and we extend a heartfelt thanks to all for their meaningful support. So introductions, and then we'll, we'll bring on our speakers. Napoleon Jones Henderson was born in 1943 in Chicago, Illinois. At 25 years old in 1968, during the apogee of the Chicago Blacks Arts Movement, Jones Henderson was a member of the Chicago-based artist collective COBRA, the Coalition of Black Revolutionary Artists. The collective changed its name in 1969 to AfroCobra, which stands for the African Commune of Bad Relevant Artists. Uh, during the formative years of Afrocobra, Jones Henderson created large pictorial woven tapestries, like you can see behind me, uh, that were included in the group's important series of exhibitions. Jones Henderson is one of the longest continual active members, and today, Afrocobra is one of the oldest continuously active American art collectives. Uh, tonight's moderator, Carter Jackson Brown, is a Miami-based artist, curator, educator, and co-host, co-founder of Brainville, a creative music platform and radio program on WDNA 88.9 on the FM dial, with over 20 years of experience in community radio and events programming. In addition, his dedication to the arts, Carter is the founder of Ad Hoc Cinema, a spirited film and music presentation series and Knight Foundation awarded after school arts program dedicated to exposing the greater Miami area to the world of global cinema. So without further ado, live from Roxbury, Massachusetts, give it up for Napoleon Jones Henderson and from Miami, Florida, please welcome Carter Jackson Brown. Camera's on, here we are, a toast. Yes. Napoleon. Okay, I'm here. here. you are. Yeah. I am now going to be <laughs> blasting out the days, Napoleon. Yes. What can I tell you, brother? Yeah. Hey, man. Your future's still so bright, you gotta wear them. Hey, I know. What can I tell you? So <laughs> Listen, how, how you been? I've been good, man. I've been I've been really good. I've been really good. And in, in light of in light of our, our societal conditions, 
uh, I, I steadfastly move forward and and think forward and you know keep my mind in that motion of progression. You know, yeah. how are you? How's how's everything up there? Hey. Everything is fine. You know, the only thing I miss is being able to go to my second hand store. But other than that, this is the rhythm of my life being engaged with my work. And so um, notwithstanding the rigor of just disassociation that the circumstance of this uh, COVID, as the brother said in the Senegal, COVID-19 has us all caught up in a different kind of rhythm. But nonetheless, uh, I'm still moving forward. And you got to, and you got to. You look great, man. Well, I'm doing the best I can. You look great. And where are you right now? Are you in, in your studio? Well, what? the whole house is my studio, but I'm in this one room in my studio, which is, yes, I'm, I'm in the room uh, where I do a lot of my um, um, uh, silk screen printing and, and things of that nature, because I work in a number of different media, which you'll see when we look at the images. Yes, yes. <laughs> so... I like that idea. So in your home, you have uh, stations, if you will, of uh, where you create. Well, actually, I live in this house. It's, it's a big 40 by 40 foot square house, uh, three stories. And I um, actually, it's located in such a way the sun comes up, rises in the morning and wakes me up. And I move around and work in the house, primarily based on how the sun flows around the house, because when it drops into the shadow in one part, I'll go to the other part. So I'm uh, staying engaged in my work uh, based in time with the uh, elements. That, that is a beautiful, beautiful rhythm. So you, you find, so you, so nowadays you, we're, we're having more sunlight. Where does the, where does the sun set in the house and, and what are you doing? Uh, what's, a, what's a normal day of, uh, of, of the sun cycle for you when you're working? Hey, the normal day is from sun up to sundown, and so these shorter days, as we are in now, I uh, I still go sun up to sundown, but I continue on to about twelve midnight or one in the morning, because I work uh, pretty much. I'm I'm up as early as five six o'clock in the morning, if not earlier, and I might not go to bed till twelve one or two. So uh, I guess I'm pretty close to achieving what I said I wanted to do when I was in my 20s. I wanted to work my way up to where I didn't have to sleep at all because I got too much work to do. Heard that. And, and, and you sleep long, you sleep less when you, when you, when you get older, right? That you seems know, to be- Well, people say that, but I guess you have to get there to find that out. So I guess since that's what my rhythm is now, I guess that's true. <laughs> I mean, I'm getting up there myself. Uh, I'm still a young man. So are you. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, uh, and I feel like I'm sleeping less because my mind is reeling, you know, like I'm thinking about ideas, uh, uh, you know, that that can, uh, you know, blend into another idea. And, you know, some, I, I don't even bother with the alarm anymore because it seems like I'm just on this 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 uh, natural clock and I tend to wake up before the alarm uh, goes off. Uh, and I'm getting to the point where I feel comfortable enough to not even bother with that. Well, you know, when you pay attention to the body and the rhythm of the universe, you don't need an alarm clock. I've, I've actually, the last, the last time I had a watch, I was in high school. And uh, I don't have an alarm clock. I don't use alarm clocks. And more often than not, I uh, figure out what time of the day it is based on the fact that the sun's going down. So, oh, hell, it's getting dark. And in these short months here, it really is a rough situation because the sun won't come up up here until maybe 7, 7.30, almost 8 o'clock. And 3.30, 4 o'clock, it's starting to get dark again. And I, you know, so that's a, that's, a, that's a rough space, but I understand that space because I've lived it all these years. And so I'm cool with that. Wow, that's really cool. I haven't met too many people uh, that don't wear watches. I, I, I too stopped wearing a watch when I was in high school, it just, I, my, my father wore watches, uh, most people that I know, but I never felt comfortable with that. So that's really nice to, to hear someone validate, you know, a watchless life, you know, clearly, clearly it, it, it's, it can be done. Oh, you know, it, it, you know and uh, I, I sort of uh, approach it from that, whatever time I'm wherever I am, I'm on time. You know, so uh, I'm never out of time, uh, but I would like to have a lot more time, though. 
<laughs> so uh, you grew up in Chicago. Um, how was that for you in the in the in the early years? Well, you know, uh, it was a wonderful life, uh, and that's not drawing on any other uh, pejorative situation. But I had a very loving family and a loving community that was in, and uh, all my people they come from basically Mississippi and Alabama, and most of Chicagoans have come just as on the East Coast. Uh, we came from those southern states to the, I say from down south to up south, and pretty much all of us in a lot, to a large extent were family members. Uh, and we also, when we got there, we grew our families because all of us had a whole bunch of cousins who were not blood, but they were cousins nonetheless. And so growing up there was really a very rich experience for me because I was uh, really very lucky. I attended George Washington Carver High School and uh, which we were in uh, for a, a portion of my uh, young life from, uh, I would say maybe 10 years to graduating from high school. We lived in Oak Hill Gardens, which is on the outskirts of Chicago. Uh, really, if you chose to take off and walk in about a couple of hours, you could walk to Gary, Indiana from where we live. But um, I had a very uh, wise, spirited and strong group of uh, teachers in our high school. Uh, and many of those teachers, uh, actually we only had two white faculty in our entire uh, uh, school. And many of the uh, faculty had uh, gotten their educations at uh, HBCUs and some of them who were from Chicago, uh, such as our physical ed teacher, uh, had graduated from the University of Chicago. But they came and, you know, as we are in now what we call Black History Month, uh, that was every day all year at George Washington Carver High School because these individuals were steeped in that and that every day is Black history because as we are living, we are the living history. And so uh, they were, of course, in Chicago, you had a great number of uh, uh, luminaries uh, in the sciences and the arts and literature and performance and music and activism. And so all of those individuals were people that I as a young growing individual had opportunities to interface with little did I know who they really were and what they were imparting. But it landed on me, it made an impression on me and it became, as I say, if you grow up black in Chicago, you have to make a decision not to be an activist because that was the way you were raised. You had to be that way in order to survive Chicago, uh, which it's not just in Chicago, but we, we're like that all across this continent. You yes. know, we've been that way. So uh, it was just a very rich, uh, rich upbringing. You know, we had people come to us. I mean, Sammy Davis Jr. came out and did a performance for us in our gymnasium. Now we had, I think it was only about 65 of us in our graduating class from high school. So that tells you something about the school. We had a total of about 500 children in the whole school from grammar school to high school. Oh, so it was wow. a very small, tight knit community. It was almost, you could say, it was a little village. And it was one of those things where wherever you went, somebody knew your mother or your father and uh, you got straightened out if you were on the crooked road somewhere. Right, that's right, that's right. Um, what what year are we talking when you were in high school and, and, and about to graduate? Uh, what, what uh, years? I graduated in 1962 for some people listening. They might think that that's, you know, several centuries ago, but it wasn't that far back. Um, uh -huh. 1962, I graduated and uh, I had the opportunities when I was in uh, junior college, which now they call it community college. It's a two-year degree um, to move on to a matriculate from a four-year institution. And I, had a, I was very lucky. Uh, I had a wonderful art teacher in high school named Helen Joyner, who had uh, come up to Chicago from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And uh, she's the person I think who really put the fuel on the fire of my uh, uh, desire to be and continue along the creative path uh, in terms of being a visual image maker. And um, at 
to junior college, I was uh, lucky and fortunate, I should say, enough to uh, have an instructor who uh, made it possible for me to get the opportunity to go to Europe to study at the American Artists and Student Center in Sorbonne for uh, a short spell, which uh, <laughs> interestingly, leaving the United States and going to the other side of the world and being able to see artworks that you had only seen on paper and at best uh, totally just, you know, knocked over with the fact that they were more awesome there in real life. But it was an experience beyond the art, but it was an experience in terms of understanding that I was a global person. I, was, I, I lived in the entire world. I met people from all over the continent of Africa and all over Southeast Asia who were in school there. And many of those individuals, I'm sure were some of the individuals who went on to become leaders, scholars and other individuals in their countries of origin. Uh, and it was a, a place in which uh, I left this country to go there and I took with me a copy of James Baldwin's uh, Another Country. That's what I read from here, over there, and from there back. And yep. so then, and then that's just, I would say simply evident of just how I was raised and how I was schooled and educated. You know, uh, it wasn't a plane ride. It was a place to, you know, refresh and expand my understanding of things through one of our no, uh, very notable authors. So I would say he was the image maker as well because, uh, he put pen to paper, and if you read it, you fully were engaged in a creative and visual process. Well, it sounds like he took all the tools with you upon that journey. How long were you in Paris? I was in uh, Paris for the, the full summer, uh, and then I met a sister named Carol Allen Ward from California, from Oakland, actually. Uh, and she was in another program similar to my program. There were several programs like that from different parts of or different institutions around the country. And we uh, took the opportunity after we finished uh, all of our classes and hitchhiked from, uh, from Paris to uh, Spangdalem, Germany, to the Air Force Base there. I had a friend who was stationed there at the Air Force and we stayed there. Then we went from there to Luxembourg and then to, uh, to Rome. And she then had to come back to, to uh, almost say Boston, had to come back to Paris to come home, but I still had more time. So I went on to uh, Nice and to Pisa and to Florence. And I just, you know, and then found my way back. I mean, hitchhiking with people, people would pick you up on their motorcycles and you hey, yeah. get in their car. I mean, something that was just, uh, it, was a, it was an awesome experience. It was an, it's an experience in which it, I would say what it did, it, it made what I learned in high school from those rich individuals who taught me, uh, I was prepared to deal with that. Yeah. You know? It made you a it, it's it made you a stronger human being. It oh, it opened me up entirely. You know. Uh, and travel is really, you know, even if just traveling in the United States, travel is a extraordinarily uh, broadening experience. Uh, because one uh, really, not only in terms of people, but in terms of geography, the landscape, how the, the, the celestial bodies are available to you on different sides of the planet. And when you are in a different location on the planet based on the axis of it in the relationship to the stars and the moon and the sun, it's an entirely different kind of rhythm and your body has to be in touch with that. And, and especially if, you wish to receive the nourishment that that kind of experience is making available to you. Because there are many people who travel and all the thing they know is uh, they stayed at a hotel and they ate at a restaurant. Right. But they stayed at a hotel and they were eating at a restaurant in the hometown where they live. Yeah, they did a package tour, they stayed at a resort, yeah. they completely removed from the, from the, the, you know, the, the experiences uh, that are available around them. It's, oh, it's absolutely. They, they, never, they never get the experience because they just stay with, the, right? and I saw that firsthand there. And I, I was determined from that year when I went there, I was never going anywhere in the world on a tour. If I, 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 
I remember years ago I saw a film. Uh, it's a film based on Paul Boyle's uh, uh, book called um, "The Sheltering Sky," and it's with uh, Deborah Winger and uh, uh, Malkovich. And they are these, you know, wealthy uh, socialites that are traveling, you know, uh, all over North Africa. Uh, and they are wealthy, and they've got their, you know, their huge, uh, you know. Uh, uh, suitcases and 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 uh uh trunks of you know that that sort of like early 20th century travel for the you know for the yeah. white enthusiast and uh but what struck me in the in the in the, in the in the film was they were you know i was young when i saw it uh they were talking about the differences between being a tourist and being a traveler and that really that really sort of planted the seed of the of, of what that means. And, uh, and I, and I too, uh, in my, in my global travels, uh, understand, you know, uh, the experiences that you, uh, were engaged in. It's, it's so vital. Oh, uh, there's, a, there's a distinct difference between being, uh, educated and being intelligent. Yeah. And many people who are educated are less intelligent than many people who are not educated, quote unquote. Agreed. Agreed. So I know you grew up. That, those times for me, uh, Napoleon, uh, were pivotal as a as a young man learning about the music of those times. Uh, I got into jazz uh, in high school, uh, and then when I started getting really deep into it, a lot of the early part of my education and learning the historical, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, sort of periods and were and timelines, if you will. Clearly, you know, for someone my age, the 60s was the most pivotal uh, period for uh, the black, you know, black music uh, in terms of jazz and creative music. And, and, uh, and so around that time, I've seen a lot of, you know, footage, I've watched a lot of, you know, listened to a lot of, uh, a lot of live concerts, you know, in Europe and in Japan, you know, here in the States. At that time, when you were in Europe, for me, that's like historical period for some of the some of the greatest music that was appreciated. You know, at that time, you know, uh, Coltrane and Dolphy and and you know all all these all these pivotal you know Ornette Coleman, uh, you know, uh, were going over to Europe and performing in the countries that you just mentioned. Uh, did you get a chance? I know that you were you were traveling. For you, well, let's just say for you, when did jazz, uh, for instance, uh, take, you know, come into your life? And being from Chicago, I, I, I like to think that it's, it, it was inevitable, right? Well, it came into my life when I was uh, in high school. Uh, I still have all of my albums from there, and I still have my uh, record, my uh, council uh, with the raise up top with the turntable inside and the radio that my mother bought me as a gift for my birthday because I was so into the music. And I, I still have that because it's a Zenith uh, stereo console. But uh, I've always been involved with it because it was also in the school. We in Chicago, of course, has a, a vast number of clubs of all genre of quote uh, music, uh, starting with the church as a place for the same kind of music as we go to the club. And so it was one and the same and it was a mix because you, of course you had Mahalia Jackson and you had all the other gospel singers and the staple singers and so forth in Chicago, but you also had all the musicians coming through there. Ahmad Jamal opened up his first uh, 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 nightclub called uh, the Alhambra on 63rd, 62nd and, and uh, King Drive. It was then called Drexel Avenue, but it was changed to King Drive. And so you had, uh, the Southside Community Arts Center where all kinds of exhibitions as well as, as musicians playing there and at the various libraries like at the Hall Branch Library on 47th or 46th and uh, uh, Michigan. Uh, I used to, when we lived just not far from there before we moved to Oak Hill Garden, uh, I was being the oldest of eight and with my uh, uh, extended family, sisters and brothers, there's 13 of us. Uh, I had the responsibility, as all older children usually do, to make sure while mom and dad was off working that the others didn't get out of hand. 
And so I would have to, at that time, it was just four boys, me and my three brothers. And I would, uh, we would go after we got out of school to the Hallbrats Library and to read and to engage ourselves in the activities that took place there until our mother came home. And it wasn't until I was in my, I think in my fifties before I realized that this little woman who used to come and read poetry to us at the Hall Branch Library, who I had as an adult become close to as a practicing uh, artist in Chicago was Gwendolyn Brooks. I mean, so this is the, that's, that's the kind of life I grew up with. You know, just these were the people in the neighborhood. These were the people who were in the community. They lived down the street. And so you had uh, the musicians, of course, they couldn't stay in the hotel, so they stayed in the community. We had hotels, we had people who had rooming houses, and they were friends and associates with many of the other performing artists, because Chicago had a great number of, uh, uh, of uh, musical artists uh, in all of the various genres. So, of course, it was deeply, deeply rich. And it was not only because Sun Ra used to play at a club on 35th Street, you know, he's playing blues. And then, you know, on Wednesday, he played his music and everybody in the joint couldn't figure out what the hell was going on. And, <laughs> but after a while, people just, they left, left him alone, let him do what he was doing. And they kept tipping their little drink and talking to whoever they were there with. And uh, they were school. But so it was, Chicago was just a very rich, rich environment. And it was rich from the cultural perspective to the activist perspective and from the religious and spiritual perspective. And it surely was a place that everybody uh, who grew up there uh, felt always at home. And of course, you know, we had the West side and we had the South side, you know, the two different tribes of black folks. And, uh, but we all came out of Mississippi, Alabama, but there was this sort of a distinction. It's sort of, uh, it's like, I guess they would say the difference between Harlem and Brooklyn. You know, it's one of those kind of things, it's territorial. But we right. were all in love with each other. And when you went to one other person's territory, everybody knew you weren't from there for various kinds of reasons. But you, you got no flack from it. It's just that uh, it was that kind of thing that was just uh, deeply, deeply rich. And the visual arts was um, one of the uh, landscapes that uh, artists travel across from one space to the other, you know. and. Uh, it was uh, a very, uh, very healthy environment. Beautiful. And so when did you really start to delve into the, 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 um, the you know, the environs of, of who you were becoming and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the collaborators and the, and the community uh, figures that would lead you uh, to Afro-Cobra? Well, and the collectives as, as such. Well, I would say I've always been engaged in the collective aspect because that's just how we lived in the community. You know, collective in the sense that one family helped the other and we all helped each other in high school doing homework. Somebody knew a little bit more about how to do math than somebody else. And I, I knew more about how to draw and do those sort of things. And so we always had those kinds of collaborative uh, environment uh, uh, challenges. And so I was always good and interested in the visual arts. And it was encouraged by everyone in the school and all my family encouraged me. And of course, sometimes they look a little skew at me and say, mm, yeah, okay. But you know, like in churches, you know, you are invited to sing and you may break up all the notes and shatter the windows, but everybody tell you, baby, that was a good song. Keep on doing it. You know, the Lord loves you. And so uh, they gave me that type of encouragement. And uh, as I uh, started uh, venturing more into the city because it was about, we live on 133rd Street. And so think of a city block from 133rd to 47th Street, you know, you got almost a hundred blocks. So yeah. uh, venturing into town, going to junior college because there was no college junior or otherwise out in the uh, area where I live, uh, I began to meet other individuals involved in the creative arts because you had people uh, and at that time in the early 60s was the big sort of beginnings of what we would call black studies. And uh, we had people teaching black uh, courses on different subjects of black history in the junior colleges. And you had uh, the different individuals like uh, who taught drama and theater and writing and literature and history. 
uh, who were in these institutions. And therefore, I began to meet a lot, many other people from many other spaces who we all sort of focused and came to that one location, which was at the college. And uh, that's how I began to meet other artists in the visual context, how I began to meet other young and upcoming uh, writers and poets and, and dramatists and others who are political scientists, activists. And so uh, getting into the city, I was lucky to have met Margaret Goss Burroughs, who started to, uh, was one of the major uh, influential individual of the Southside Community Arts Center and who started the uh, DuSable Museum of African American History, uh, which was in her home at the time. Uh, and so going to her house and then being engaged with all of her colleagues who were all members of the intelligentsia and the arts community uh, across the board from, I would say, the Harlem Renaissance, they were the person because they were young at that time. And so they were bringing forward that experience and the knowledge that they had, they were sharing it with myself and other young artists and other in the young interested individuals who were involved in the uh, betterment of life for African people around the world. We were uh, able to see and benefit from the sharing that they uh, gave to us. And they gave it with the full caveat saying that this is not for you, but this is given to you to carry on forward to others. Because that's how we got it. And that's, and I tell you, I would, uh, I could not and would not change a moment of my life growing up. And uh, of course there were always bitter moments and everybody has bitter moments, but then again, that's uh, when you put a little honey in your Kool-Aid and move on down the road, you know, uh, it becomes better, you know, all along. And so I would say that's where, when I got out of high school, started in college and got further into the deeper center of the city in the black community from the South side, what we call Brownsville, where I virtually grew up until we moved to the gardens and I came back to it. And it is uh, the place in which uh, the AACM, the Art Ensemble of, uh, of uh -huh. Chicago, Coomba Workshop with Val Gray Ward and Francis Ward, uh, EPE, the Institute of Positive Education with Haki Amada Budi, and uh, uh, um, Abina Joan Brown and, and Hoyt Fuller, who was the editor for uh, Johnson Publications uh, uh, Negro Digest, which he changed the name to Black World. Uh, and of course, Ebony Magazine, the Defender newspaper, uh, and being uh, very good friends with uh, Bobby Sinsack, who was one of the, the heirs and son of the uh, Sensac and the Defender and extraordinary photographer, uh, which in the slide presentation, one of the images that is in that slide presentation is one of Bobby Sensac's images. It's the one of uh, Jeff Donaldson painting on the wall of respect. And oh. so, uh, I mean, Chicago was, I would say, if anything, almost overflowing. Uh, I, uh, you were, Napoleon, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Um, it's just such a rich history when I think about Chicago. Um, you were so fortunate to be, uh, a, you know, uh, growing up in that era and that time and, and being exposed uh, to so much beauty and, you know, and excellence um, uh, at a time when, you know, clearly, uh, as we all know, historically in this country, uh, Black people were always uh, under attack. Uh, uh, was there a period uh, as an artist, uh, as a young man uh, growing up in America, uh, was there a stage in your life where you began to explore more militant uh, sensibilities, considering those times, you know, uh, you know, in, in that era of the 60s, you know, uh, those pivotal figures that were uh, in that mid 60s period uh, that were, you know, changing the, 
the cultural fabric of our society, uh, you know, uh, Martin Luther King, but particularly Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam. Uh, did you find uh, 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 interest in those uh, 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 and that movement in particular? Uh, so oftentimes it's by default. Uh, uh, I know that someone like Charles Mingus, for instance, who had, uh, you know, he grew up, he was probably maybe about 15 years your senior, maybe a little more. Yeah. And he was already, you know, he they were already dropping a lot of, uh, you know, uh, politically driven music. Um, and guys like Mingus as an artist didn't feel the desire uh, to join uh, uh, these organizations. However, he was in line with them at all times. Uh, was that something for you that you explored or did you continue or uh, political? Uh... I, I would say the the political and social and religious context was all interspersed together. And I, our approach, my, our, and that's how I think it is, after October, we, and many of the artists, uh, were looking for, not looking for, but just trying to decipher how it is we could best uh, be an ally to and a mover forward of the energies uh, and desires that Dr. King and others were expressing. Uh, so marching was not something that I was inclined to do and surely not turning the other cheek. Uh, so we began to look at our culture and decide that we needed to affirm and reaffirm the authenticity of our community our culture. It was nothing uh, aberrant about it. We knew it, we lived it, we are it. And so the artists of Africa Cobra, what we decided was that we needed to uh, take a closer look at what it was we were immersed in, which was ourselves. And so we set a, 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 a set of aesthetic principles and a philosophy by which our work was driven. And that uh, is something that we came to by a closer look at ourselves, our community as a whole, and understanding that uh, the cultural assets of African people are always ever present. And we only have to affirm ourselves in that and accept that as the path, because that's the only legitimate path that there is. And all that other stuff moves out of the way. Positive always removes the negative. And we always came forward not as uh, uh, opposed to anything. We were always moving to the affirmation of everything. And the everything, the affirmation of African culture worldwide and the affirmation of our humanity. And so our work is, my work, our work has always been infused and embedded in uh, elevating our humanity and surely it is based in our spiritual understanding of ourselves as a people and as we actually exist in the universe. Well, I, right there, I'd like to take a little break and because and, I, I, I came into your work uh, via the exhibition that took place at MOCA uh, uh, a little over a year ago. Right. And I didn't do a lot of research. Uh, I was just, uh, in, you know, engaged with the art. Uh, but you know, in lieu of this discussion, I went on, you know, online and, and did some a little bit of a little bit of digging. And I came across this nice kind of intro. And I think it would be a, a great way for any of our uh, viewers out there uh, to get kind of an introduction to Afro Cobra and its origins, as you were mentioning. Uh, 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 just now. Uh, Tiny, okay. would you mind uh, putting that on for us and uh, we'll kind of really get into the meat of, uh, of things here. Yeah, that was a very enjoyable night. Do you see me? When I was young, you never saw 
black artists. You never saw art that spoke in that way. So I knew classic art and I loved the art, but I never saw myself in it. You have to understand the times. It was the 1960s. Marches, boycotts. Blacks were portrayed as stereotypes, caricatures, and archetypes. The Wall of Respect was based on honoring heroes, sheroes, in different areas of the arts. That imagery might have been the first time people had really seen something positive, you know, something like this is what it looks like, success looks like. We were African Americans living in a country where we couldn't even vote in some, some states. There are places we couldn't go in. One of the things that we needed more than anything else was control over our own destiny. The wall of respect sort of showed us that we could do this. It jump-started after Cobra. It was like wake-up time. It's nation time. It's nation time. To build a nation, you need everybody to work together. Individuals can't have the impact like a group has. The first meeting was at Wadsworth Gerald's studio on 61st Street. We were really focusing on communicating visually to the viewer, and the viewer that we were looking at looked like us. I see you. Afrocobra means African commune of bad, relevant artists. The point is you speak through your work. Each one of us individually uh, are good at what we do, but collectively, we're gooder. Bad is actually gooder. Afrocobra was based on uh, trying to communicate positive ideas to the people. The positivity we were reaching for was something that we all agreed needed to be done and could be achieved. We didn't do images of downtrodden people. We're not about subjugating. We're about uplifting. You can appreciate who you are especially when you're confronted with our work because you can always see yourself in the picture. The opportunity is there. It can be negative or positive, and I want to impress upon them positive ideas. When you have that connection to a community that you're speaking to and they respond, that art is an ultimate act of love. It warmed my soul because of the fact that I felt like that I was making an impact in the community. <laughs> You plant those seeds by allowing them to know that they are worthy and important and necessary to society as a whole. Even if this is not a part of your experience, no, everyone should be aware of it. Afrocobra belongs to all of humanity. We laid everything out. We created a black aesthetic. We created a school of thought. Look at this work that's here. This is ours. They don't look like anybody else's work. You know, they look like our work, Afrocobra work. I'm black and I'm proud. And I want the world to know that. Do you see us? Right. Do you know what we're into? Exactly. Do you know what our experience is? Do you see me? Right. Yeah. I see you. That's a great, that's a great clip. That's a great clip. Thank you, Tiny. Napoleon, uh, what did you what what did you what did you start out with when you joined? I know that you joined Afrocobra about a year into their development. Were you also you were also a part of the Wall of Respect? Did you engage in that project? Hang on a second. I think we've got. Yeah. Okay. I, I actually didn't do any physical work on the Wall of Respect, but I was visiting the Wall of Respect with all the artists because I knew all of them anyway, and uh, or many of them. And at, but at that time, I was I had just begun to to uh, study for a back, bachelor's degree at the Art Institute of Chicago, so I had classes. But I was back and forth when my time was open for that, and of course I lived not too far from there. But uh, I wasn't an actual participant in the painting on the wall, but I was familiar with all the artists. And so um, to the extent that my, my spiritual presence uh, was a part of the collective energies, you know, of, of what was happening in the uh, visual art scene in, in Chicago as a whole 
was one of those uh, 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 with the manner in which we all, I'm saying we all being all the visual artists in Chicago interacted and, 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 and supported and encouraged each other on, you know. Cool. Are you, what were you doing at that time? What was your primary medium at that time? I know you're a multidisciplinary artist. My, uh, my primary medium at that time was, uh, I was uh, registered, I was a full-time student at the Art Institute in Chicago, which was connected to the Goodman Theater. And so I had a minor in theater and I was a major in textile weaving at the Art Institute of Chicago. So I was principally, my medium was textile weaving, uh, which is my uh, foremost uh, medium. Uh, well, was, I should say. I, uh, then as I uh, began to engage with many other artists uh, and especially uh, in the larger community and became a little bit more uh, uh, deliberately engaged with the Afri-Cobra, uh, all of us, you know, Wadsworth was a painter, Jay was a fashion designer, Barbara was principally silkscreen print artist, uh, Jeff Donaldson was a painter and watercolorist, Nelson Stevens was a painter, Carolyn Lawrence was a painter. I was a weaver, tapestry weaver. Uh, and uh, Gerald Williams was a uh, painter. And what we uh, did is that we, we had critiques every Sunday or every other Sunday at Wadsworth's big old studio. And everybody brought work that they were engaged in uh, at the time. And we had discussions about the work. Uh, and those discussions were uh, focused on uh, helping each of us achieve what it was we were seeking to achieve by the collective co uh, contributions of all of our intellect and artistic skill. And so it wasn't, uh, it wasn't quote, a critique. It was a, uh, it was a service, you know, like a church service. Cause we, we, we cooked and we had meals there and then and little, little Jerry, uh, their first child, Jay and Wadsworth's first child uh, were running about. And so the, the energies of what was happening with the wall of respect and across the art scene in Chicago as a whole, the South Side Community Art Center. And there were a number of other small galleries set up by, uh, and Tini, you can let those flow at your own rhythm. It was, it was, let me say something about this first image here. That's the AACM, members of the AACM on the left and little <clears throat> Jerry right down at the bottom. And there's little Jerry sitting on his daddy's lap in the, on the right. That was Wadsworth Studio. Both of those shots were taken there, but that's the AACM and Africobra uh, we just, we cousins, we brothers, brothers and sisters together because uh, what they were doing in the music is what we were doing in the visual. Absolutely. And, and for some of you that aren't aware of, uh, the, the acronym for AACM is uh, the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians. Right. Uh, and, and this is my old studio I had there in Chicago before I came to, to Boston. Of course, you can you see the Adinkra symbols on the panes of the windows and the, the name of the gallery was the Ankh Gallery. So uh, that was the affirmation of the identity of our Africanist. And these particular works here were works that were a part of my fellowship competition when I graduated from the Art Institute of Chicago, which I was awarded a, um, a traveling fellowship. And one of the jurors was uh, uh, our recently departed brother, uh, David Driscoll of which we, uh, we lobbied and told the university they had to have it, at least one black juror who came and juried that show. And so uh, uh, Driscoll was that. And these are some of the tapestries of my earlier 70s and the titles for all of them are on there in the mediums. But these are the uh, critical works. As a matter of fact, the work on the, on the left is a, 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 an, an exact application of a, one of Barbara Jones's silk screen prints entitled TCV, Taking Care of Business. And so it was about, you know, projecting positive images, because of course that's an African in the sculptural context of forward frontal uh, appearance looking right at you and all of the lettering surrounding the head of the big Afro, because we all had those big tailored Afros at that time, you know, and if uh -huh. you didn't have your Afro in tight condition, you know, you were looked at a little bit askew. And 
<laughs> and the tapestry on the other side is just simply one of those uh, related to uh, two of the, the uh, quote, as they were called, gangs in Chicago, the Peace Stone Rangers and the, the Black Stone Rangers and the Peace Stone, Nation. So uh, we can move on with some others here. Was that was kind of, uh, so that was rather than a, I, was, it, was, it, was it sort of two things going on there? Genocide on a global level, but also well, local? Well, we was talking about, well, we were, I was addressing the, the genocide that we were perpetrating on ourselves with all this mindless killing of each other. And even genocide to the point of the hatred and dis, 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 disorganization within the community is a genocidal act in the sense that it's genocide in this generic context is that you are deliberately annihilating something of value or if you do, something you don't value. Uh, we needed to take control of that. So that's consequently this other piece came on, the holy people and Barbara and I collaborated on a lot of stuff uh, works and these are two, uh, this is a vest on the left and a dashiki on the right of leather uh, that I made, which I still have. Uh, those were her, her designs and my execution because I used to do a lot of work in leather. Uh, those are the I, two, man. Huh? But those were the times too. Leather oh, was absolutely. Those were the, I was I was where we wore our art. Uh, Jay Jarrell did the same thing with all of her fashions. They were works of art that we wore, and so the work of art, like in her Jay's uh, 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 gorilla suit, the with the bullet uh, uh, bandolero bullets across the ship. The bullets are actually pastel oil, and so wow. our bullet, in terms of a weapon toward the, the, the struggle toward a, a greater humanity was the pastel drawing crayon. With that, we could, we could create things that were just as lethal and informative as a bullet and made Ooh. just as lasting an effect. And this yeah. is a tapestry uh, woven vest, uh, which now resides at the uh, Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York City. Uh, I made this for a friend of mine who's now deceased and their family uh, donated it to the Cooper Hewitt. And next, uh, uh, Tini, next. Okay, yeah, and this is uh, one of the large tapestries of four pieces I did uh, in 1982 for commission for the Atlanta Hartfield uh, International Airport when uh, um, Maynard Jackson was mayor who was responsible for building that huge airport down there. And I was one of, uh, I think 25 artists that were commissioned to do works uh, for different locations within the airport. And this is a tapestry and a charcoal uh, drawing of Jack Johnson on the other side, uh, Jack. who uh, is the protector of all these women that we see here getting their hair braided and central figure there. And uh, just, you know, 10 feet, across by 10 feet high. And where is that, where is this tapestry now? I, have, I haven't the slightest idea. Most of the work that was in that uh, airport from 82 has uh, gone somewhere else because actually in the public art realm, and you can go to the next slide, Tini, in the public art realm, uh, works only have to have a life of 20 years. After that, they usually, a lot of them get removed and uh, who knows where they go. And this is another, this was an applique piece with the actual Dan mask in the center of the figure there with uh, the braided uh, hair. And that was my photographer at the time, Donnie Dixon, a good brother who is still here in Boston. He and I had many, many wonderful times together with his, his daughter and my two daughters and him and his camera and me and my camera and just, you know, living it up. Uh, you can go on, Tini. Uh, and this is the beginning of a series of pieces that I'm still working on uh, called Requiem for Our Ancestors. And this piece here is a piece that was uh, dedicated to the spirit and the, and the work of June Jordan. Uh, those are uh, applique uh, sewn textiles at the lower bottom. Uh, photo uh, transfer, as you see in the center of the frame piece of June Jordan herself. And the entire structure itself is a small uh, cottage, so to speak, but there are no windows or doors. And that is a place, a sacred space for the spirit 
of those individuals to reside. And uh, the top, the shingles of the roof are uh, enamel on copper. So it's a mixed media piece. And of course the uh, mud cloth there. Next one. Uh, and that's the smallest one. This one is roughly seven feet high. And this one is uh, to the four little girls of uh, Alabama, the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing where those four girls lost their lives. And they are ensconced in the, uh, the, the segment, the structure at the top, but the structure doesn't have four sides. It only has two sides, which is speaking to the aspect of a part of the building having been destroyed with the bomb, including those young girls' lives. So it's not a full structure. It's a structure that is absent of a part of its resin. And you see the cross is hanging askew. And so all of that piece is uh, seeking to uh, speak to the devastation of that event, but it also is a memorial to these young women that they are not forgotten and they should not, uh, their spirits are still with us. And the piece is based on the uh, Egungun dance mask uh, in, in the lower portion there. Uh, Nick. And these are still a part of that, but these are in the sort of two dimensional bar relief type pieces uh, in the Ancestor Requiem series. And the other one, the Do Lord Remember Me, and that was a little, the little girl when you reached a certain age and you started to let you wear a little stocking and put a little heel on, and you got your hair all done, you got your little Bible in your hand, you go in the church with your grandma or your mama or your daddy. And of course, the other one over here is Duke Ellington. And that's, uh, you know, him and his, the famous uh, photograph of him and his tuxedo, but I took his tuxedo and turned it into a p piano keyboard. Love it, I love it. That's hot, man. That is, and it is so, you just know it's Duke. If you know Duke, you, you, you recognize that right away. And uh, that's beautiful work, man. I, I want to slow down just a little bit mm -hmm. because I know that we, I know this, uh, you and I could talk for at least three hours and it feel like one. And I know, I know a lot of people out there really want to see uh, your work and we're going to get through that and also uh, make room for some, uh, the Q and A. Right. Uh, but um, I wanted to backtrack just, just a little bit. We won't mm -hmm. talk about it much, uh, but you know, I, I'm, I, one, I'm, I'm devastated at the fact that that work at the Atlanta airport has gone, you know, is lost. Uh, uh, but another thing is at that time, and I know that you are aware of this and a lot of people are aware of this or beginning to be aware of it due to one, uh, a, a, a series called Mind Hunter, yeah. uh, and then also, uh, which, which, which delves a bit in the second season, well, quite extensively about the Atlanta child murders, uh, during that period. Right. And then. And then the HBO uh, series that came out last year uh, that's uh, uh, re sort of revisiting uh, that horrific time, but also uh, examining uh, uh, the, the, uh, the new investigation uh, of those murders. You were in Atlanta at that time. Were you there long enough? And I know it, was a it became a nationwide uh, 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 topic and subject and, and, and awareness uh which led to things like you know uh, uh classic you know uh right. saying in the news do you know where your children are uh uh you know it was when they were beginning to put missing children on the back of milk cartons right what was what was the climate like in atlanta for you at that time and how long were you there uh, yeah. uh well, actually, I, I was aware of what was going on in Atlanta, probably as much as anybody else in the rest of the country through the news media and various other uh, uh, situations. I created those works here in Roxbury in my studio and I transported them for installation in Atlanta. But I had lots of friends who from Chicago moved to Atlanta in the early, late, early 70s onwards. And uh, uh, another good friend of mine, Tony K. Bambara, who you are surely aware of, the writer, uh, uh, filmmaker, was uh, someone who I had conversation with, you know, back and forth about what was happening down there. But when I went down, my time there was really very brief. So I really didn't have the opportunity to engage in community as much as I would have liked to because I was there taking care of business, getting these works finalized, installed, and working with all of that 
that that entailed. And so my colleagues over at Spelman and Atlanta U were individuals that I would either stand with one or the other as I resided night by night. And I would have engagement about it, but it was definitely a very uh, uh, heightened and anxious time. Uh, and still, I don't believe the truth of what took place there is going to ever really be known. Uh, yeah. But it was definitely a devastating situation, and you could feel the tension uh, within the community, even in my brief encounter going out eating where I ate and just doing, going about the city as much as I had the opportunity to. Uh, let's continue, Tiny. I, thank you for that. I just, I, I've been, uh, I was a young man when that was happening and it just, you know, all over the country, uh, parents were just so, um, you know, overly protective uh, for, you know, for all the right reasons. Oh, absolutely. And kind of, uh, and that same uh, sense of protectiveness and uh, looking at and being aware of what's going on in our communities is still important today. And that was one of the things that was very much present in the community I grew up in when I was a youngster at that age. Uh, so it's just, you know, and this work that we're looking at here is sort of speaking about referencing some of that in the sense that uh, this work here at the lower register is a representation of the larger community walking in lockstep of unity in protection and advocacy for the things that they wanted to have in that community, safety and, and health and everything else. And so this is at the uh, Roxbury Community College, which was designed by uh, one of the uh, stellar uh, architect, black architectural firms in the country, Stull and Lee, uh, for David, uh, uh, Bob, Don Stull just recently passed away in last November, but uh, both of those brothers, uh, Don is from Ohio and David Lee is from Chicago. A lot of Chicago folks here in Roxbury kicking up a lot of dust, you know. <laughs> uh, so keep, Tina, you can just advance them at your free will. And this is in Providence, Rhode Island at the convention center there. And this piece is entitled um, uh, Procession of the Ancients. And as you can see in my work, the highly activated energetic surface of color and design and rhythm and pattern is all reminiscent and about infusing the, the, the modal aspect of music, sound, vision, because many of the aspects of music is color. There's an auditory and a visual aspect to it and color has the same thing. And I consider the works that I do, I call them uh, visual music because a lot of the, the individuals who are, who are in my works on music and these blind boys of Alabama, of course, uh, are extraordinary individuals and they are not only spiritual uh, 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 gift givers, they are also saints. And that's uh, replicated by the gold around their heads, which is a symbolic aspect of the visual arts we all know to represent sacred and, and, and religious aspects. And this piece here, of course, is about the uh, New Orleans and the rhythm of the Mardi Gras, which this year, unfortunately, has been uh, put on hold, but nonetheless, it's still there. And my public works, uh, other public works, this is the latest piece I did in 2020. I got this installed in Roanoke, Virginia at the library just before everything went crazy. And those are all the children, some of the children who I worked with going back and forth in workshops and they helped me pull together the designs. There are actually three similar pieces, two other pieces similar to that, uh, that's in that uh, 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 quartet, I mean, uh, trio of sculptures on the grounds of the uh, library there. And- uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, no, no, no. Start, uh, when did you start teaching? You're, you're, you're an educator. Uh, I started teaching in 1969-70 okay. at, at Malcolm X Community College in Chicago. Uh, and that's the uh, 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 stack photo of Jeff. This was at the very beginning of what was to become the Wall of Respect. Uh, that was the condition of the building that we uh, decided we were gonna make it into a a public beautification situation, one of the aesthetic uh, importance. Uh, but I started teaching at the uh, um, 
at Malcolm X Community College. And I taught there for uh, about two or three years. Then I uh, took some time off to try to go back for graduate work. And in 1974, a group of students from Boston uh, came to Chicago for a, a National Conference of Black Artists Conference, which Margaret Burroughs, David, uh, Charlie White, Elizabeth Catlett, some, uh, 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 Samella Lewis, and many others uh, started this organization in 1958. And uh, that's how I got to Roxbury. They, asked, they came to my studio and saw these big weavings. And you can keep on just going forward, uh, Tini. As I mentioned, or maybe I didn't, at the Art Institute, I was also a major in textile, the minor in, in theater, but I also took independent study in filmmaking. A good buddy of mine, we made a lot of uh, 36, those big heavy Bolex cameras running around Chicago. So photography, film, uh, printmaking, ceramics, textiles, all of it is a part of just what I do. I, it's their material for me to execute whatever aesthetic kind of statement I wish to make. And uh, these photographs, I have a, I've got probably 20 or 30,000 photographs of sisters and women generally around the world as I've traveled their fingernails, this beautification of their fingernails and hair with all the manifestations of black beauty and black joy and getting that, getting your head in and uh. you do it to death. And these are also, resources for me for my visual works like the enamels and my prints and my weaving because braiding hair is the same thing I do in weaving and as was mentioned in the opening piece yeah I braided my daughter's hair until they got to the point that they could do it or, or, or some of the sisters who I knew would pick it up and take it on and I got relieved of my responsibility on that end but uh, anything in textiles I can do right? from shearing sheet to spinning yarn to dress in the loom, weave in the product, hey, I do it all. And that, and that, and that is, you know, that, that thread, you know, the lack of, I think, pun intended, has, has, has been the, the rhythm of all of your work. Uh, Absolutely. Even the, even the, the, the large pieces, the ones that we saw uh, that were more use, you know, using tile. Right. Uh, still, to me, looked like those great quilts uh, um, you know, that Berkeley, you know, have been a part of Black culture. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, from the South, even, you know, going back to weaving, African weaving and, and uh, just beautiful, beautiful work. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's you see, it's, it's painting with cloth. We've done it in the quilts and that goes all the way back to the Kenti cloth, the, the homey quilts and all the rest of the textile. I mean, the what we're doing in braiding hair has already been done all across the continent for centuries. What we're doing, you know, in textiles, the same thing. My grandmother uh, was a crocheter. She just crocheted all the time. She'd make these big caftans. She, we, she would crochet these long strips and then she would all sew them all together to make a larger blanket. And yeah. I was at the Art Institute still and I, I said, grandma, I said, big mama, you know, look, you know what you're doing I showed her a piece of Kenti cloth. I said, they do this. This is how they make these large fabrics in Africa. Yeah. She said, well, they got a nerve to be copying me. And I said, okay, you got it. All right. But see, the stuff is, you know, the, it's in the bones. It's in the, in the DNA. You know, we do it as a matter of fact and as a matter of everyday being. And this, this brother and this sister here, these two, they were so... They were two very spiritual people I met just by happenstance. The young lady on the left, I met her at a TED talk in Savannah uh, in 2019. And this young brother here, I met him uh, this uh, past summer when I was photographing the uh, Black Lives Matter situation. Because this was the, at the painting of Black Lives Matter up in Nubian Square here in Roxbury, which used to be known as Dudley. But we uh, came together, petitioned the city and got a uh, uh, um, um, uh, got it changed. So it's now uh, Nubian Square. Uh, and these two brothers here, the brother on the, on the, on the right is an artist here. Uh, and that's him and his daughter. I caught them coming out of Whole Foods one day. And the brother on the other side, he was 
Karen and his daughter going into the MBTA, which is a rapid transit station. And so I said, hey, can I, can I get a shot of this? You know, because I had lots of photographs of brothers with their children, you know, because that's just BS that black men don't take care and be engaged with their children. We've always been, because of my daddy and my uncles, my granddaddy, all of them were involved and the others who lived in the community. So, you know, when I see these images and plus, just look at the brother on the left. They're, they're, they're all, they look like one of my works with the colors they, they got going on, you know? Cool. So easy with it. And so it's just uh, these, this ceremony here was a blessing ceremony to remove all evil and bad spirits from the gathering of individuals who gathered down at Nubian Square for a Black Lives Matter uh, gathering this past summer. And these sisters, and that's just two of the whole community of these sisters, they had an entire uh, ceremony that they laid out and uh, they burned sage and incense and cleansed the individuals who were all gathered there. And uh, of course, the sister with the writing on her looked like one of my works, you know, uh, all these strips of cloth with all these messages and such on it, but uh, just, you know, just extraordinary. And uh, I love the environment. I'm always traveling somewhere, and this was riding on the mega bus up at the top level going to New York. And as we were crossing the bridge coming in off the uh, highway into the city, and the fog, I mean, this is just just yeah. breathtaking. That's a work of art. Engineering, that, that oh, feat of it. Yes. Absolutely. It's just, I mean, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a master art, and the evidence of it is the pyramids. You know, because yeah. they they can't they couldn't even build a pyramid now. And this here, uh, the right hand side is uh, 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 the uh, a tower at the airport, Mid uh, Midway Airport in Chicago, and these are the chimney sacks on uh, some houses in Venice, uh, of which I got in 2019 when I was there for the Africa Biennale uh, exhibition, and just the extraordinary beauty when you take the time to stop looking at a damn cell phone and look up all kind of beauty you know and i've got tons of photographs of water towers in new york city and these were these are on the right hand side three uh, um, uh, cell phone antennas out there uh, along the in the swamp lands on uh, coming in from new york city passing up to saugus uh, Secaucus, uh, new jersey and the other one on the left is just one of the portions of a grid of one of the bridges I was passing over there. And this is uh, what's the remaining part of a church from the uh, St. Uh, St. Helena's Island and down in Beaufort, South Carolina, the Gullah people. Oh yeah. It's basically made out of uh, a concoction of seamen and seashells and all the indigenous material that's there. And this structure has been standing there uh, in that condition, uh, being very stable, all it needs to have is a roof put on and chairs put in and get back that's to Sunday service. Uh, Africa, that square, is, that, that looks flat. The top is flat with the, with the yeah. clear. It was yeah. flat and then sloped on the two eaves and uh, that allowed for uh, the water to run and any other elements. But uh, just being in that space, you can feel the spirits of all those people who have been there. It was, it's a spiritual experience uh, extraordinaire. Uh, yes. I, I know that we are, I'm just having to be a little cognizant of time. I know that uh, we wanted to, because I could keep doing, I could keep doing this with you, Napoleon. No, well, that's, that's, yeah, I want to talk with the people. Uh, let's kind of, uh, if we could, uh, Kevin, Tiny, maybe open things up uh, to take a few questions from uh, our viewers and listeners. Okay. There we are. Yeah. Uh oh, and you gotta put your mic on. Kevin, you got to put your mic on. Okay. Can you hear me? I got you now. I just want to shout out to some people joining the feed from London. We've yeah. got Jay Lawrence in the UK saying Janet. hello. And we've Janet. got 
And we've got Marilyn Nance in the feed saying greetings from Brooklyn. All right. And uh, well, Kimberly Green, basically really loving the, the, the whole idea of being a traveler versus a tourist. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just, I wanted to ask a question about, um, you know, it seems like you've worked in so many mediums from your beginnings to the present. Is there any art form or medium that you have not tried yet that you want to try? Um, oh yes. And there are too many to, uh, to enumerate right now. So as soon as I can get out the house again, uh, mm -hmm. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get right to it. Uh, I would really very much like to uh, uh, really experience having a uh, animation studio, so I can actually uh, create some animation. Uh, I film, video editing, and all that sort of stuff. I've got a good finger in that. I know that well enough. Uh, which was actually why I went to Micah in 19. I'm not 19, but in 2002 to get an MFA because they had just opened up this extraordinary. Uh, film uh, media uh, uh, facility. And so I went down there and immersed myself in that to move to another level. So, um, and then clearly there's some that I haven't even come across yet. So when they, when they surface, I'm gonna be all in it. Exactly. Yeah, you gotta put the intention out there. Oh, so yeah. hopefully in you know, 2021, 2022, some animation opportunities will will find their way to you. Um, we have a question here from uh, Kimberly Green asking you, how do you feel today's music corresponds with today's art? Um, well, I would say, and this is, this is proportional to the entire landscape. Uh, I am sometimes troubled by some of the visual work I see uh, that in a way reminds me of some of the music that I hear in this particular context. I think all too often there is an element of dissonance that is the major element which I think interrupts the spiritual connection to the work that's being produced. Uh, because there is uh, a necessity for one to be able to have a ebb and flow in one's existence as opposed to a staccato kind of jumping. And uh, I, but I see a lot of exciting uh, visual work and I, see a, and I hear a lot of exciting music. And I'm sure uh, when I was younger, uh, there was some music that was along the same line as some of it now that I don't necessarily vibe to. And there was also surely some visual works then that I also didn't vibe to then as they are now. So I think that the, the, the landscape is pretty much the same. It's just that we had another place on the arc of the journey. And so um, I'm, not, I'm not down on any of it because all of it is valid. Uh, because even when you make a mistake, that's the validity of you not traveling that same route again. Can I piggyback on that question from Kimberly? Or do we have another question, Kevin? No, go, go on, sure. Uh, uh, who are, in, in lieu of that question, uh, can you name maybe a couple of artists and a couple of musicians uh, that you are uh, inspired by or really into right now and are, are excited about uh, what they're doing? Uh... Well, Kamasi Washington, we were just playing. He's one of those individuals. Uh, and I, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm always uh, elevated and motivated and pushed forward by uh, my club members, you know. Uh, and I say my club members, you know, the, the folks I grew up with, the Archie Chefs and the Eric Dolphys and the Train and Al Alice and John Coltrane and uh, Max Roach and uh, 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 Roy Haynes and um, uh, McIntyre, Maurice McIntyre, Maconda, 
and I could just keep on going with them. Uh, but there are a lot of younger musicians of, uh, of, of note that I listen to all the time. Uh, but I will say that the uh, major dish of my uh, auditory diet are many of the individuals that I've mentioned. And of course, you know, Mahalia Jackson, the Soul Stirs, you know, uh, Bobby Blue Bland, and uh, John Lee Hooker, of course, is my main and You know, so I, they all there. So they, they just, the younger, those who are contemporary right now, they just have to find, I'm, I'm, putting, a, I'm putting a shelf up for them, but the bookcase is full. And I always go back to, the, to those books and, you know, they move me every day. Kevin, how much time do we have? Tiny, do we have time to uh, play that last video? Uh, one, of, one, of, one of Napoleon's favorites uh, from the AACM. I, I do want I do want to post post yes let's do that but before we do that I want to I want to read from the the chat right here and I okay. forgive me if, if I don't get no. the name correct but hello brother Nap sister Akua here oh Ek yeah Akua right okay Akua. so good to see you and hear you <laughs> how would you like to have your work preserved and your archive to be accessible for future generations. Hey, that's an important question, which uh, for the last couple of years, I've been digging at it a little bit every day, every day. And I'm uh, in the process now of trying to locate a uh, facility in which it will be uh, 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 archived. And there are a couple I'm talking to at the moment. And again, it's an important uh, uh, endeavor. And if you have any uh, intro on it, any suggestions, you know, uh, my contact information will be on the end of this piece. Uh, you know, hit me up, you know, let's talk about it because I've been having the same conversation with all my other club members, telling them to get their stuff together. And I've got a couple, I've been fortunate that I have a couple of young uh, mentees that have taken, uh, taken the task to sort of help me put this stuff together because they see the importance of it. And they're like my other, my newer children, my two new daughters. And uh, so they're busy working with that. And, and thank you for putting that out there in the universe because uh, we really do need to take, take, uh, take responsibility for that because uh, it's, an, it's extraordinarily important. And it's very, very important. Time, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, from Jay Lawrence, who's just asking, how has African art from the continent influenced your work? Tremendously, tremendously, because if you can just recall back at the lower register of that enamel uh, set of doors at the library, those are stylized Sanufu sculptures. And I, you know, just took that stylization and I also have them walking in what is a standard kind of depiction of human forms in ancient Egyptian paintings called the Isaf, um, uh, uh, um, uh, I, I, it won't roll off my tongue at the moment, but you see the figures all walking in profile in the same step, you know, isosophily. That's the manner. And so you have all of those influences that are present in my work. And especially when you think about the Dogon and how they deal with the planting and the, and the whole astrological uh, foundation that they deal with, that's all impregnated in the work in terms of the way the patterns and designs and shapes and such uh, work. And again, a lot of the work I've moved away from it having a rectilinear format. It's a curvilinear format, which I call it my curvilinear rectangle. You know, because if you take that little fan shape I use, and if you flatten it out, you got a rectangle. But when you put a little hump in its back, you got a <laughs> curvilinear thing, and that's another kind of rhythm. And I, piggybacking on that, I'm just wondering if you can just share one short anecdote uh, about Festac 77. Dynamite. Okay. It was the most incredible event to take place in the last century. And I'd say that there's no apologies or any other kind of step back from it because it was uh, a spiritual cleansing and it was a spiritual and aesthetic uh, launching on a global context of the universality of African people and the African spirit and the African aesthetic. 
And that's not just in the, in, in the visual and performing and musical arts, but it's in the intellectual, the architectural, the uh, cosmological, the theological, and the academic. It was all across the board because all of that was covered there. Because I remember one particular event because Nelson and I were sharing the same apartment at Festech Village and we were walking out and we saw these brothers coming down the road with this, this, this blonde, these big blonde afros. And these were brothers from Australia. And uh, we were having a conversation with those brothers and nobody spoke a word. Yeah. And when they finally got up close, we just nodded out and started walking together. That's the, the that's the aspect that in Maryland can tell you that. Uh, she was the official photographer. And uh, so it was, it was, it was a spiritual uh, experience. Well, I was going to ask, I mean, you did have your camera there. Well, I you know, actually I didn't have a camera at that time. Uh Oh, and the reason I didn't have a camera because I had to break my butt to get from Chicago to New York to get on that plane because Jeff said, if you don't get your butt here when the plane shows up, you ain't going because it's going to be coming on short notice. We didn't know whether it was going to be there or when it was going to be there. So uh, that, no, that's not true. I have to wait. I have the old stuff up. I did have my camera. I have a lot of slides there. I don't know how I don't open my mouth and say that. Uh, but then again, that's what we're waiting to see. That, okay. That's why we need to get an archivist. And we, <laughs> all of this stuff is just waiting to uh, to be revealed. And, and the reason I forgot is because it's, it's on film. I'm thinking in digital terms, uh, it's on film. I've got trays and trays of slides. Yeah, I got all my, I got about uh, 10 trays of Africa Cobra slides I shot there. Yeah. yeah, all over the place. Amazing. Hey, man, what can I tell you? Well, yeah. is there a closing video you want to share? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, uh, this is, you know, this is one of uh, uh, Napoleon and my, my favorite, I, I too uh, source from, you know, from uh, that pool of thought, that school of, of ingenuity and creativity. Uh, this is one of the members of AACM, uh, Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians out of Chicago. One of my favorite uh, members of that group, uh, Amina Claudine Myers. Oh, absolutely. She's the bomb from, from Arkansas. Yeah. Forces of the age of the spiritual Mundus, a production of all consciousness, rousing the sleeping, the sleeping super-related powers, alive by prowess. Pronouncing the genuine and the sublime in art. Sculptures, poets, painters, and the architects, musicians, composers, singers, songwriting, songwriters. The awakening by it. It came to live and change upon all and the numerous ensemble, awakened by the strength of this need. the spirit, spiritual mundus, 
a production of all consciousness, rousing the sleeping, the sleeping super related powers alive by prowess, pronouncing the genuine and the sublime in art. Sculptures, poets, painters, and the architects, musicians, composers, singers, songwriters, the awakening by it. It came to live and change upon all. And the numerous ensemble awakened by the strength of this need. of tonight yes yeah. wow uh that was a great great track to end on or start on i'm not yeah, sure it's a start on it's a start, yeah. it's a start. Just, ain't, no, ain't no ending this is the yeah start. just want to know when we can bring her to miami and yeah. when you do let me know because i gotta be there yeah. yeah so i think we we we've done a good job here i want to thank you both really for joining us and yeah. making this happen and, um, you know, you like know, I said, like you said, we can go on for another three hours and our, our audience is hanging on, but uh, we, we, we might want to let them go take care of some other things. Yeah. Think about what was discussed. And, yeah. uh, you know, you can watch this on YouTube again, if you'd like. Um, I want to remind everyone that uh, the Africobra publication is just out. And uh, pick up a copy if you can. It is a beautiful must-have book. And um, I also need to give a special shout out to our Greensboro, North Carolina-based poet, Mr. Nick Corman, who crafted the excellent toast to Napoleon without at the beginning question, of our program. Without question, my brother, I must take my hat, which I don't have, off to you, but I will comb my hair for you. Yeah. Nick is it. He, Nick is an international poet, a spoken word artist, a workshop facilitator, and a motivational speaker. And he uses his art to teach African-American history, Beautiful. address a myriad of social issues, to advocate for, all, for just awareness. And uh, he's, traveling, he's traveling in the route of positive images and positive messages. Yeah, That's look for Nick at, uh, at ndcpoetry.com. All of his videos are incredible. And it's like um, just history in really amazing digestible chunks. Very good stuff. So yeah, well, hit me up, brother, because I want to uh, have a have a chat. Yeah. So this brings us to the end of tonight's program. I want to thank everyone for joining us. We hope you enjoyed conversations at Mocha and join us next week, Wednesday, February 24th for Conversations at MOCA, Life and Spirituality in Haitian Art with Dr. Kyra Malika Daniels and jean Daniel Lafontant. And then next, on Friday, February 26th at 7 p.m., please be sure to check out Virtual Jazz at MOCA 
with Jean Caze Sextet, uh, with our MC Carter Jackson Brown. That will be on your radio dial WDNA 88.9 FM and at mokonomi.org. So um, we encourage everyone to visit our website, follow us on social media channels for up to date information. And um, thanks for tuning in. And in the words of Napoleon Jones Henderson and Sun Ra, space is the place. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us tonight. Napoleon, bless up to you, brother. To, 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 to all of us in this collaboration, because this is the ultimate of collaboration. All right, yes. everyone. Good night. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tiny. Thank you, Mocha. All right, yeah, Tiny. Yes. That's wonderful. Thank you all. all. Right. Easy.